So welcome back, Shirin. Thank you for being here. So we were saying already in the introduction that uh, the dialogue that you established with this historical figure uh, on Kosum was very complex and also very personal for you. So when, when you started working on this film, you actually wanted to make a biopic of On Kusum, from what I know, but after two years, you decided to change. So it seems that during the process of writing the film, you went through a similar struggle of your character, Mitra, no? when at the end, she feels that the film doesn't correspond anymore to her vision and she decides to change it. So I was wondering how, how you started and, and how you approached the, the, the story and at the same time, why this change happened while you were working on the script. It's an excellent question. I mean, for most of my friends who know my work, um, even though my work is not autobiographical, it's always been very personal, deeply personal. And so when I develop an obsession about an issue um, that concerns me, um, I, um, you know, I make it into an artwork, into a film that I can put all my questions and obsessions. And in this case was, you know, the question of, what it takes to be a successful um, woman artist and what do women have to sacrifice in order to achieve their passion um, and how is it different than men. Um, so originally I, I, I really truly started with this idea of a larger than life biopic about the most iconic mythical artist of the Middle East and you know sort of glorifying her and after a few years sort of you know delving into the script um, it really seemed like an impossible task and also so uninteresting to just only show the success and achievement of an artist and who never had a, a dip, never had a failure. And, and I realized that, you know, ultimately that's what it is to be a myth. You know, you don't fail, you just give everything you have um, into what you're doing in her case. But what the failure or what the challenge was, it was on my end, my inability to make a proper film about a mythical artist. And that's why many Egyptians and Arabs had not tried to make a film about her because she was untouchable, you see. So the film really then turned to become my own journey and my own you know, exploration of my own obsessions as an artist who, by looking at a, 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 a bigger, more iconic artist, was trying to find answers for myself uh, as a non-traditional woman, as, as someone who's devoted everything um, to her arts, to her creative juice, and, and, and always battles between, you know, having a child, wanting to have a normal life, and yet devoting everything that I possibly can to making work and to my fans and to, to creating a dialogue, you know. So really it became um, about two characters, the director and her obsessions and her journey, and then Omakosun being that mythical figure. And the, I think the climax of this, of this dialogue is kind of the end of the film, no? Where, where you, for me, it, it really raises, because the film raises a question that it's, uh, what, what story is an artist allowed to tell in a way? And I think this is such an important and relevant question in the contemporary art discourse today. Uh, can you work on the struggle of a country that you don't belong to? Are you allowed to tell the story of an Egyptian singer if you don't even speak Arabic, as there is a line in the film, no? This woman that approaches the Mita in the cocktail and says, but what do you understand of this woman if you, if you don't even speak Arabic, no? So, um, and it seems to me that you in the film are on, on the one hand celebrating and reclaiming this artistic freedom. I, I'm thinking about the moment at the end of the film when, when Mitra says, you know, when to Onko Sum, like, sorry, you know, I, I, I was tired of your greatness. I wanted to change something, no? So I, I'm free to, to do this. I want to be free to do this in a way. Or I want to be free to stop and say that the film is not my film anymore. Uh, and on the other hand, you're really in the film exploring the limits uh, of it and the limits of this freedom and the risk associated to, the, to it. So I think in the, the end of the film is really very, very significant towards these questions. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more how the end scene came together, yeah. if you agree. I, I think it's, it's a really excellent point, um, observation. Um, the character of Mitra, it's sort of embodied uh, how I see myself. Um, you know, I'm a very tough person, very ambitious, 
very aggressive when I want something, but I'm very vulnerable, very emotional, and very fragile. Um, and I think that's a quality uh, of an artist, especially as a woman artist. Um, and I think that what Mitra was battling with, which is the essential part of being an artist, is this paradox of being strong and, and devoted, but yet very fragile and vulnerable, didn't exist in Omokosum because she worked all her life to remain an image and construct an identity that was untouchable, you know, and it almost like in order to really at, arrive at that point of mythical success, you have to become like a rock. And, and I think this was the overall meaning of the film or the message that, you know, while um, Mitra was coping with her own humanity and her own artistic nature as, as a very vulnerable um, artist who really had a lot to say and really want to make the film, but really yeah. failed and felt defeated, she was looking at this um, person who never once had a failure and therefore she fictionalized her failure. And I think, you know, this is something I um, battle with every day as an artist, um, but I always see it as a strength, not, not as a weakness. And it always surprises me when I meet artists such as Omiko Sum who, who, who really um, don't allow vulnerability and they think that you should be like a man you know you should always act like everything is great but it's not great and you know you can aim high but there's so much suffering and pain in in the process and why can't we just admit to to the our shortcoming as human beings so this film was really about you know this difference between what how one artist um is really dealing with her own humanity um, and the other just wanted to sort of go above and transcend the humanity as we know it um, and, and be a mark in, art, in the history of arts in the Middle East. And so it really is a very complex subject, but that ultimately what you talked about is it's really the essence of the film. And, and to me, it's one of the most, uh, you know, again relevant questions of our of, of our times but also it's i find it extremely courageous to um expose failure and admit failure uh, and the value of failure also within the 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 creative process because uh, i think it's so important to discuss this in a society that only celebrates perfection no and this is an american society even more a western society even more and does not consider anymore the value of failure the, the value of doubts and within artistic practice, uh, not only for artists, but I believe also for curators and producers, uh, the process, the painful process and the, the doubts and the failure have to be, and we shouldn't never be scared about this. And we shouldn't be scared about exposing this or, or, uh, or giving credit for this, I think. So. Yeah, and it's, it I, I, I just have to tell you, Leonardo, I've had my own share as an artist who kept changing my medium, let's say from photography to video to film. And every time I changed, I took a, a lot of risk. Um, I rebelled against my own signature and my own success in a way. You know, when people like the calligraphy over the photograph, I started to make double channel projection videos. And when people started to like those, I went to make movies and people kept comparing one to the other and judging me and saying, this is not good. Her earlier work was better. She's better as a video artist. She's better as a photographer. And all this judgments that were more rooted in the fact that I, I was really taking a lot of risk and therefore I was opening the door for more failure and more negative judgment. Um, and so I've been beaten up from, let's say, critics to the government of Iran, to the Egyptians who criticized me for daring to make a film about Omokosum. And, and I think um, it's made me tougher in a way. And it made me realize that it's absolutely true that not everything I make is great. You know, it's a lot of flaws, but you know, I dare to do things. I dare to experiment and I dare to change. Um, and, and this is really not in the system of the art world. 
Yeah, but also also the fact, well, you've been also recognized in all the fields that you ended up working with and with amazing awards that I will not even start listing. Otherwise, this conversation will end up being too long. But, <laughs> but I think it's also the understanding of how failure in certain aspects is really fundamental to arrive to greatness on, in, in other moments. And I feel for me, this is the part of the film that I... Uh, that I related the most. And then on the other hand, of course, um, your work is very much about opposites, the notion of opposite, uh, man and woman, East and West. And you, I think you've mentioned this uh, before also. And one of the other very important elements is the clashes between the idea of personal and professional, no? the, especially in the relation to the career of a female artist. There are a few scenes that are very much about related to this and also about the struggle of being a woman uh, in a world dominated by men there is this i think one of the s most um, symbolic scene in this sense is the test you know when she's when mitra is showing the film in a room where there's only men and most of them are white of course and uh, so this is this is definitely another of line that it's very present and that kind of puts you in a dialogue or mitra in a dialogue with with uh, on yeah, I think the pressure of success, um, the pressure of delivering a perfect work, um, it's, it's a reality I think every artist deals with, but particularly with female artists. It's as if they have to work double the work of the men. Uh, like, for example, myself, every time I try to make a film, it's like moving a mountain. I have to convince so many people to get their support financially, um, even throughout the artistic collaboration. So many men I work with. Um, I feel like I struggle so much. Uh, the work that you are talking about, looking for Omikosun, took six years. Uh, Woman Without Men took six seven years to make and normally that shouldn't be the case but um you know I, i'm currently working on another film so from artistic um to to practical um you know issues that one has to deal with in order to make something happen while you are also being clear to your vision emotionally artistically you see i think that's the challenge because you know like I almost have to become like a masculine in order to be pushing the project to happen, raise the money, get the people together, you know, convince the collaborators to work with me, you know, all of that, which is not artistic. And yet when it goes to the ideas and the vision of the film, I have to be fully in control of what is the essence, you know, what are some of the deeper issues that I'm trying to convey so I have to always wear two hats, you see. And I think this is what Mitra was experiencing because at once she was trying to make the best film she could, but she also had to deal with the producers. She had to deal with her collaborator that is betraying her and, and, and the pressure of people who accused her of not speaking the right language and, and, and a culture that she was foreign to. So these are the realities of how I'm working in every time of a project is truly like moving a mountain. I cannot describe enough. And it's happening today as I try to make a movie in America um, and it happened in every two projects. So really I think that the story of Mitra, it's a really a true reflection of female artists, especially a female director with the ambitious vision in making a complex, international project and maybe that is my fault because if i was just a painter at a studio in new york you know i wasn't trying to make a film about an egyptian star in morocco you know raising money in italy and germany and france maybe my vision is too big but why not why can't men do it and women cannot do it uh, you 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 introduce this idea of moving so so much for your uh, for your projects and for your career and you often define yourself as a as a nomadic artist so to to bring the conversation to the now to the current very difficult situations that we're living in the whole world but especially in america um right now um maybe as you as we said nomadic between different mediums but also uh I imagine moving uh, around the whole world and rarely being in new york for for longer than 
than a few days. So how did you cope with the condition of lockdown and in, in these months? Uh, has this been something that uh, has changed also your approach to the medium and, and your work? I tell you, Lenore, that this year has been the most significant historical year um, since I've been alive. Um, you know, uh, first it started with America attacking Iran and, you know, this possibility of war with Iran in January. Then the coronavirus came, which, which was a global pandemic from Italy to Iran to US. And as we went into the lockdown, now we have this incredible protest mm -hmm. and then we have the election and it's been really weighing very heavy in every single um, person on this planet. But also right now in America, I think it's one of the darkest, one of the most problematic periods of American modern history. Um, and it happened to be that for the last two years, I've been involved in a project, a film, that I also made some art related work called The Land of Dreams, which is very much about America, about the identity of American culture that is being compromised. Um, how we once looked at America as the land of dreams, and now is a place that could be easily compared with the Islamic Republic of Iran in terms of what you see in terms of corruption, fanaticism, um, you know, political injustice, racism, discrimination. Um, and, and um, you know, we have a president that is at war with his own people and, and and it's just an un unbelievable, the catastrophic situation. So for the past two um, years, I've been traveling uh, and working in New Mexico, uh, making a film uh, from the perspective of an Iranian immigrant about the American culture, um, about how it is to be a marginalized person, marginalized community in an American culture that is more and more uh, developing into a white race that is trying Trying to become purified in, in many ways and, and, and whether you're immigrant or Native American or black or Mexican um, you are in trouble basically and we have a president that is moving toward that kind of hor horrifying um, discrimination so I feel um, you know I'm, I'm in a lockdown and I'm of course we're terrified and, and we're trying to follow the rules, but at the same time, we're outraged and we feel this is even more important of a time for artists, for people of creative imagination to have a voice, and even more important for artists of marginalized communities, immigrants, black people, to be vocal, you know, not just in the media and protests, but also making work that it's speaks to the people about what is going on. And early on, we talked about how everything that I do drives from an urge or from an obsession. And I feel so passionate about that it's time for me to admit that I am as American as Iranian. That my critique about American society is as critical as my critique to Iranian society, maybe even more important today, because this country is going in worse shape than Iranian society today. Um, so this is what it is. Uh, we're caught in between being just a citizen in this country, but also being an artist and just trying to digest everything and seeing how can we help? How can we voice our you know, responsibility and a response to and help in solidarity to our black friends? and everyone that is being discriminated against. Yeah, and this is a discourse that obviously it's, it's now exploding in the US, but it's very relevant in Europe as well, of course, with all the migration that, uh, that the crisis that we had in the, past, in the past years. But there's one sentence that uh, strike me that I read these days in relation to George Floyd's uh, killing. Um, and, and it was a sentence that says that racism is not getting worse, it's getting filmed. And of course, uh, although I, par I partly agree, obviously, with the, with this sentence, and because racism has always been there, and we've always known cases similar to the one that uh, provoked the, the riots these days, but um, but at the same time, there's no doubt that the political climate that uh, the Trump presidency has 
has legitimized certain behaviors and uh, and it is it is definitely different it's it feels different uh, with with the us presidency it feels different with the with the populist governments and the populist movements and uh, political parties in europe and and this i think as you said as artists but also as curators as pr- uh, cultural practitioners we absolutely have an, an, an massive responsibility to raise questions and to to create programs that address these issues you see um the artists are you know there's it's so complex because in the american society we're dealing with an economy that is in absolute decline unemployment a virus that is spread and killed so many people and now we have massive massive unrest so the country is collapsing in in a state of crisis in every dimension mm-hmm. people are furious they are poor they are sick and and there is so much uncertainty about the future and we're dealing with a monster who may be reelected um and and so you know there is no choice but going forward and even with all the amount of uncertainty in some ways i think it's good that the genie is out of the box maybe trump being the president it's it's really caused all of this rage to finally come out where it wasn't coming out when obama was in power even though there was still a lot of racism going undercurrent you know and and so i am very optimistic that the american people are waking up possibly to the fact that they must take control of the destiny of this wonderful country that is being taken away from them and with all these people pouring into the street as long as it's not violent as long as it's peaceful it has to be a positive change and and i think the idea of unity and the idea of people taking control um it's so significant where does the art world fit in an art world with 3 months ago was all about money all about the market dominated by the market will the artists be more politically conscious will the artists be able to articulate a response that is not just escape for the rich you know is it possible that we could be a part of this process of change i really don't know i mean the sleepy art world is like it has to has to up, absolutely wake up in the film world i think you will expect there been escapes during the corona lockdown are going to have to end and people are going to want to see films that are meaningful and that are reflecting on what is happening on this planet with the environment the economy with racism with you know with corruption um with fascism you know and 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 i think that therefore what have people been doing listening to music watching movies you know and and uh, you know this is the moment that art actually can become very significant so this is my feeling i'm very optimistic but i do feel like you know the art world has been quite irresponsible for the last many years and i'm hoping that things will change we all hope that definitely um thank you so much sirin i think i think on this on this hope and on this uh, praise i think we we can close this conversation and uh, and i i really hope that we will be able to host you a third time in florence with the with the making of this uh, new film that you're working on when when is it scheduled uh, do do you have a well we're hoping yes we're hoping to shoot in the fall if the um the virus allows and uh leonardo i just want to also apologize if i sound very emotional but this is a very emotional time i woke up this morning to everything about the protest and i mean i i'm just we're all so anxious and so worried and and i i do feel like i'm more emotional than normally i would be um but i think we're living through the crisis and um we're all on the edge between the virus and the political climate and um so it's a very tough period and i really hope that we will see better future and i'm so glad things are looking better for italy um and i wish every single person in italy the best of health and the best of the future and and thank you for bringing me back to this festival and to this wonderful conversation 
Thank you so much, Sirin. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you all for following the conversation and the film. And uh, good night and maybe good luck. <laughs>